Welcome back to the Vintage Ballers Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Carino. And on today's episode, we have Mike D'Andrea joining us on the show. Mike played football for Ohio State in the early 2000s, where he won a championship on the 2002 Buckeye squad. He is currently the owner of T3 Performance in Avon, Ohio. So without further ado, please welcome Mike D'Andrea. I want to thank you for joining the show and taking the time to do this. And obviously, me and you go way back. And I want to start it off. Go back to your childhood, young kid. When did you first fall in love with football? I mean, I'd, I'd probably have to say, you know, when I was eight or nine, um, you know, growing up playing at uh, Sunset Park. I know you're familiar with that. And uh, it was just, you know, all the kids in the neighborhood would get together. There was a big wide open grass field and we'd, we'd play there. We'd play at, uh, I think, Brett Mitchell had a had a large yard or whatever. And we'd actually hit people into the walls of the, the other house and like it, like it was arena ball before arena ball existed. And uh, so, yeah, early, early on, man, early on is when we started. And did you have any favorite team player back then? I mean, was it the Browns? Was it, who was your favorite NFL player back in those days? Uh, Barry Sanders, I would say hands down, man. I, I would drop everything to watch him play. I mean, I, I love watching the Browns. Obviously I'm a huge Browns fan, but, but if I could watch Barry Sanders play a game, I, that, that was, that was it. Do you think Barry to me? So him and Akeem Olajuwon are my two favorite athletes of all time. Mm-hmm. I think Barry, just as a pure running back, I've never seen anybody like Barry. I've never got to see Gail Sayers and those guys back in the day. But as far as the last 35 years, and I, I you know, I think he's the best running back I've ever seen. Um, yeah. who, who do you put up there with? Besides Jim Brown, we got all the older guys we never saw. But last 30 years, you put anybody and, up there? You know, with? so it's funny. I, I would say Barry Sanders, Walter Payton, uh, you know, guys like, I mean, Jim Brown was, he weighed as much as some of the D linemen. You know, like, I, I think it was just a different game and he was ahead of his time physically. And that's what really helped him, um, you know, but, but like Sanders was just, I mean, no one had the skill he had. Same with Walter Payton. Um, Emmett, Emmett Smith was, was, you know, awesome, but he was, he was also like, he was just kind of a tough it out kind of guy too, you know? Um, yeah. Where, where do you put Nick Chubb in this conversation? If Nick Chubb has another five or six years, like he's done so far, you know, do you, where, do you, would you think he could be an all time great or do you think right now it's just too early to determine that? Oh, if he's healthy, he'll, he'll be an all-time great. Yeah, I mean, the way he – I mean, his his speed and his his burst and vision for that size, man, that's it's crazy. Um, and, and he's a super humble dude. He's down to earth. He, he actually, I think, is either dating or married to someone from Avon. Oh, really? I so his that. kid plays in our flag football league and um, super low-key dude. And I don't know. I'm, I'm always a fan of guys like that. I mean, he seems like the kind of guy, when I watched him, somebody, I don't know if it was Clowney or somebody recently said that he's the best running back they've ever gone against. It was someone mm-hmm. they just signed. I can't remember who it was. And, you know, you're right. He's kind of, he's just elusive. He, he, he doesn't really look fast, but he is. Um, he has breakaway speed. He's smart. He's intelligent. I mean, that play where he ran out of bounds when he could have scored a touchdown just to save yep. the Browns, you know, you just don't see many players do that. I, I think Nick Chubb, I'm a huge Chubb fan. I think not just because yeah. I'm a Browns fan, but I think he's a fantastic, I mean, what a steal in the second round. I mean, he's a really oh, yeah. a top five pick with, with his talent. He's a, he's a top five pick, but you got him in the second round. So um, let's, let's move back to your childhood. Go, you know, take us through like middle school before you got to high school. Did you ever envision yourself, you know, as a big time high school player? Um, I mean, I, I would say from early on, you know, I was probably like most kids at that age. I was, I was big into collecting cards, you know, tops and upper deck and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think I still have the binders like, five binders full of them alphabetically in order. And so, yeah, I had always wanted to play in the NFL since I was little um, and, or, you know, play, play college ball or, or whatever. Um, you know, but at the time you have no clue, you know, the path, you just go out there and do your thing. And, but, you know, I, I played flag football a little bit like second, third grade. And then I, I stopped playing for a couple of years and I started up again, tackle football. I played sixth and seventh. Eighth grade year, I was actually above the weight limit, so I had to be on the line. So I was like, I'm not doing that. So I just didn't even play my eighth grade year. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, which actually was, I don't know, I, I think kind of good. I mean, I just kind of trained and worked on just getting stronger and faster and all that kind of stuff. And and then obviously, you know, high school started back up. Now you played, for those of you listening, Mike went to St. Joe's in Avon Lake, Ohio with Anthony Gonzalez, obviously. So Anthony was a grade below and you know, played for Ohio State. Now he's a state senator. 
So um, for Ohio State and then the Colts. Draft and the Colts, the exactly. So yeah. Mike and Anthony went to the same school. So did you ever get to play in the same seventh grade? Were you with Anthony and that team or how was that set up? Yeah, yeah, we were on the same team, I think, for one year. Um, and he was always a beast. I mean, he was like, you know, fastest kid from as far back as I can remember, you know, in the school. And um, I think he was like a state qualifier in the four by four team for Ignatius you know, when he was a junior or senior, but yeah, that, that was awesome. We had, we had, when I look back at it, I think we had like four or five guys from that little CYO team go play in college. Unbelievable. And I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people from Avon Lake that always say if Anthony would have went to Avon Lake and played football there, that they would have won a state championship with the talent you guys already had. And you guys got close a couple of times and had some runs, you know, and you guys beat, I mean, I just had an assistant coach from Olmsted Falls on the show who was an assistant coach for football back in 2000 when they won the state championship. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Dan Largent. And he, he remembers you guys real well. He goes, you, you, you beat us. Only team that year that beat us, and we won the state championship over Pickwock, Quinn Pickcock. So it was mm -hmm. kind of interesting. I, I told him about you, and he said, yeah, Quinn was on the team that we beat in the state championship. So oh, it was wow. interesting how that dynamic went. But I remember you guys beat, I think, St. Peter Chanel, who won the state championship that year, and yeah. the Falls in the same year. That's unbelievable. So, yeah. um, But let, let's go back real before that. Going in the freshman year, obviously, that's when me and you met, played basketball. But, you know, football-wise, at that point, now you're looking as a freshman. You're, you're pretty – I mean, people know your name. You're pretty highly touted. Take us into your freshman, sophomore year before you really broke out. You know, what were your thought process? And, and like, what did you think, Mike, your high school career could be? To be honest, at that time, I, you know, you're not really looking out past the year you're in. Uh, at, least, at least I don't remember doing that. And, uh, you know, at the time, I, I was just – I remember coming in freshman year, not knowing many kids from the public school. I came from the private school. And – uh, running run sprints and I'm like dang I got to get my speed speed right so I mean that that was really my focus freshman sophomore year trying to get faster and um, you know uh, you know as far as like looking down the road I mean there, there wasn't I think a whole lot of that you know until you get you know sophomore junior year when you start talking to some colleges and stuff mm -hmm. and, and you played for Hall of Fame coach Dave DeLugas obviously and how did Dave impact your career at that point you know when starting when you started getting to you know playing with the older guys um, you know, what was Dave's impact on your career? Yeah, Dave was awesome from, you know, he was the first coach that I actually remember sitting down and, and mapping out my goals, you know, and it was like, you know, the grades, the weight room, football, all that kind of stuff. And um, he was a master at that kind of stuff and just the, the fundamentals to the game and, you know, teaching you, you know, you know, positions on the field and, and things like that. So he, he was definitely impactful. And Avon Lake back in those days, I mean, still is today, but really back in those days from the 90s through 2000s was a powerhouse. I mean, we were winning the division every every year, basically. I think they won, what, like, I think it was like 15 or 16 straight division titles, something like that. Yeah. It was insane what nice. they did. And they had just great player after great player, tons of great running backs. So, you know, when you came onto the scene, now we're going into like, you know, 99, 2000, 2001. Again, what was, did you guys think you had the team – that could win a state championship and, and where do you, you know, at that point now you're, you're becoming one of the best linebackers in the nation. And what, what was that like? And how did you get to that point? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say, yeah, junior year. I mean, that's when we had, like, I think Jeff, you know, Jeff Strauch was running back and Zach Lewis, a good buddy of ours played at Overland college. And um, I mean, we, we just had so many kids on that team. Um, I really thought junior year was the, the year we were going to, you know, win. And I think we only made it to the second round, that first or second round that year. And then my senior year, I think we made it to the third round. Um, and we had, you know, great talent all around every year. You know, the, the motto was uh, was reload every year. And, um, yeah, I mean, I you know, but uh, what was it? Two years after we graduated, I think they actually did win. Yep, so. it was exactly two years. Yeah, and, and you see those group of guys coming up, of course. And we had a lot of our friends' little brothers played on that team, and they were loaded. And yep. uh, yeah, they, they, they finally won the state championship. And I was happy for everybody in Avon Lake because it was something, such a great football tradition there and to finally get that championship. And I think they went back to back. They didn't win it the second time, but they went back to the state championship, I believe, the, the last year. I think like Trey Strauss was on that team. There's a ton of guys that we know on that team, obviously. But uh, yeah, that no, they, was- uh, They played uh, Brookhaven in that game. And I remember because I bet uh, Mo Hall, I don't know if you remember Mo Hall. I remember Mo Hall, yep, Ohio State. State. Yep. So he went to Brookhaven. So we had a little bet and uh, yeah, he won that one. <laughs> so- Speaking of Ohio State, Mike, you know, again, you're one of the most recruited defensive players in the nation at that time. And, you know, when you – was Ohio State always your first choice? And were there any other colleges in the mix at that time that you wanted to go to? Yeah, you know, 
I would say Ohio State was definitely always kind of top. You know, Nebraska was a close second. Um, Why Nebraska? I just love, I mean, on my visit down there, you know, at the time, remember in the, in the late nineties, I mean, they were, they, they'd come off winning a couple of national titles and they, they had some solid coaches and, you know, helping guys get to the NFL and all that kind of stuff. And, and so was they that were, coach, were, was that coach Osborne? Yes. Coach okay. Osborne. And then Frank Solich was there. That's right. Solich. To. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it was funny. He kind of reminded me of, of Trestle in in certain ways. Um, but just, I mean, the, the culture down there is insane. I mean, you have nothing but Nebraska football, right? Like it's in the middle of, of nowhere pretty much. And and so the amount of uh, effort and resources they put in, I mean, you it, it was very telling when you went to visit there. I mean, they had, um, you know, like their nutrition table was, was on another level. I mean, they had steaks and lobsters and all this stuff and their weight room facilities and training facilities. And, you know, now Ohio State and everyone else is kind of caught up and maybe even past them, but at the time they were, um, they were kind of tops, but, you know, at the end of the day, just, you know, I was always a big Buckeye fan and, and wanted to stay close to home. And with Ohio state, when you chose Ohio state, did you realize how special that first year would be? I mean, you obviously Mo Claret, you have so many guys coming in. I think Chris Gamble is around that time. I mean, there's a ton of guys that came in at the same time, a lot of future NFL stars, um, you know, take us back to number one, let's talk about Mo Claret, you know, and how special a talent he was. You know, did you know, uh, you know, did you know him before you got to Ohio State? You know, it's not like today, you know, I mean, you remember we, we had, I think, dial up internet. Uh, we did. I, mean, I, think I, I think I went on the internet just for uh, um, a, 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 AIM. Yep. Whatever that instant messaging platform yeah. was. Um, and, but I mean, there were like, you know, uh, high school, like Max, Max Prep magazines where you'd read about guys and, you know, you'd hear stories, obviously he's not too far. I think he went to Warren Harding, wasn't too far from us. And so yeah, you knew guys like that um, were just, you know, crazy talented. Um, and uh, it, it was, it was a fun first year, man. I mean, we had, we had a great freshman class, uh, a lot of, a lot of good dudes, tons of guys that went to the NFL and um, you know, it was just lucky to be a part of it. And take us through that season, you know, because again, I don't, you guys weren't the favorites at all. Miami, for those of you who remember, they were a powerhouse back then. I mean, you're talking future NFL Hall of Fame type of talent on that team. Mm -hmm. And arguably the 2001 Hurricanes team, in my opinion, is the greatest college team of all time. If you look at the roster, I think it was yeah. Ed Reed. And we can go on the, you know, Jeremy Shockey, uh, Kellen Winslow. I mean, they were just Walsh absolutely. McGahee, I think, uh, who's a linebacker? They had a couple stud linebackers. Oh, uh, Jonathan Vilma. Jonathan Vilma. I think DJ Johnson. There's so many different guys yeah. on that team that were just absolutely loaded. So, you know, you're going through that season, and I feel like you guys are, we know you're good, but I don't think anybody thought you were good enough to beat a Miami, you know, per se. So take us through that season. I think there's a Purdue game that you guys won last second. Uh, I believe it was Gamble that caught the winning pass, or one of those guys caught the winning touchdown pass. Michael Jenkins, maybe. I think it was Michael Jenkins. Yeah. Okay. You know, at that point, are you guys, I mean, you're taking it game by game, but do you guys realize how special this is going to become eventually? Are you guys thinking like we could actually do this? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I mean, we had, we had a lot of studs. I mean, you know, we had Mike Doss and Matt Wilhelm and um, obviously Chris Gamble, Dustin Fox, a lot of guys that played in the NFL. I think together, I had to be over 40 players from both teams, wow. Miami and Ohio State, that went and ended up playing the NFL. But, you know, it was funny. We, we didn't, we weren't like blowing teams out. I mean, we probably had three or four really tight games that year, you know, and sometimes not against great teams. And so that was the reason we went into the national championship game, you know, such big underdogs. And, um, but we, we just, I don't know, we, we had the ability to just hang with every team, no matter what level they were at that year. And, and it, you know, as evidenced by the last game of the year, I mean, we, we hung with Miami all game and, you know, eked it out, you know, towards the end. And, um, and I don't know if it was, we played up to competition and played down to competition. That's probably a little bit of what was going on there, but, um, you know, our, our coaches, Trestle was hands down best coach I ever had, um, you know, phenomenal person, phenomenal guy. And, and he was always just kind of even keel, you know, and I think that just carried throughout the rest of the team. And, and take us through that Miami game, like the ups and downs, and it was such a close game and, you know, you're, you're, it's close. And then of course, McGahee gets hurt and it kind of changed a little bit, but what was the emotions like in that game and what was it like on the sidelines and playing in that game? Yeah, it was nuts. I mean, I just played a little special teams in that game, but still getting on the field was was awesome, um, you know, as a freshman. And I mean, the whole atmosphere was just nuts. I mean, it was just, um, 
I mean, the, everything from, you know, my first time doing that thing, like, you know, it was from the resort we stayed in to like, there were so many Buckeye fans that traveled down there to, to driving into the stadium. And um, it was, I mean, just an awesome, awesome experience. Um, and it was like hype the whole game. Like it, it, it never calmed down. And um, so it was, it was definitely surreal. I mean, I'll never forget watching that game. I, I think I was actually at the Hadarski's house that night, but it was just incredible to watch that you know unfold. And I, I didn't think, I mean, no disrespect to anybody play for Ohio State. But hey, I, don't I, think, I don't think most people from Ohio thought yeah, it. I didn't yeah. think you guys had a chance. I'm like, they're going to get blown out tonight. And it was the exact opposite. You know, and you guys obviously played very well. And, and, and some people look back at McGahee and say, if he didn't get hurt, Miami would have won. We'll never know. I mean, who, who knows how that will turn out. And of course, there's the end of the game, the flags. And you know, there's always there's debates like that. But the fact of the matter is you guys hung in and you finally, you won. And I think that's something when I talk to people who went to Miami, they're still bitter about it. I have a couple of friends who went to U of M and oh, yeah. the UM. Oh yeah. And, and they're, they're still, they still, oh, you guys shouldn't have won that game, you know, but right. it is what it is. I mean, and that's why I think, you know, back then with college football, especially Mike, it was such a, I mean, it's a great sport now, but I think, I feel like now it's a little more predictable in some ways. You kind of know the Alabamas. I mean, they were so good this year. It wasn't even fair. I mean, they were just blowing everybody out. Where back then, even though Miami was a powerhouse, you guys still up, upset them in the championship. And that doesn't happen as much now. I feel, um, you know, it did back then. So mm -hmm. I feel with that game, that was one of the greatest games I've ever seen. You know, yeah, I, I thought that was, was awesome. one of the greatest football games in general. But so now you're a champion coming off your freshman year, going your sophomore year, and you've had some big games now going in your sophomore year. I think you sacked Phillip Rivers a couple of times against NC State. And I remember watching a couple of games where you, you were coming on strong now as a sophomore. And then, of course, the injuries start happening. And, and how hard was that, Mike, to overcome those injuries, you know, not just physically, but mentally? Uh, yeah, you know, it was tough. I mean, so sophomore year, seventh game of the year, uh, I think I originally heard it against Northwestern. I went to, you know, try to sack the quarterback and missed him. And then some linemen kind of fell on my shoulder and, and then, you know, taped it up. And a couple games later, um, you know, dislocated it. And that was my first like major injury ever. And so, um, you know, it was just like, they, we had a phenomenal medical staff and, you know, I had the surgery and then I was up and doing rehab relatively quick and, obviously missed the rest of my sophomore year, but um, came back and felt great going into my junior year. Um, and then fourth game of the year ended up tearing, you know, the ACL. And that was the one that was kind of a, you know, big bummer, uh, you know, just cause you had already come back from an injury and doing all the work, but, but, you know, I had guys around me. I mean, you know, one of the guys I was in the training room with a ton was Drew Carter. I don't know if you remember him. He yep, was remember Drew. Receiver for us and played for the Panthers, I think for a little bit. Dude was like the freakiest athlete ever. I think he long jumped like 26 feet. Um, <laughs> I think he did a couple of years of track down at Ohio State. But um, anyway, so, you know, you had guys like that that had two, two or three ACL injuries. So you have nothing, you know, nothing to complain about. Just, you know, get in, get in there, get your work in and, um, you know, hopefully you can get back out on the field. And, and did that, you know, that experience back then, obviously you own a gym now. We'll get into that a little bit later. But, you know, I'm sure that experience has a lot to do with what you do now. I've, you know, you had to go through it yourself. So you know what it's like to train, but, you know, come back from an injury and the mental aspect of it. Cause I feel the mental aspect of it is probably even tougher than the physical aspect in some ways. So, you know, we'll get into that later, but you know, at that time, Mike, did you, did you ever have thoughts of, you know, maybe one day I want to open a gym even back in college? You know, it's funny. I, I really didn't. I mean, I, I'd always loved training. I was training you know, in a gym since I was, you know, young, 11, 12. And, um, so I was always super passionate about that. And I love the idea of just going in and getting a little bit better each day. Um, but, you know, at the time in college, it was kind of like, hey, NFL is my number one goal and nothing's even close to that. Um, but but my backup option was I want to do something in business. You know, I had no, had no clue what that meant or what that was, but that's kind of, uh, you know, the, the plan back or the thinking back in back in college. Okay. I was wondering about that. And we'll get into your business later because there's so much to get into with that. But you know, at the end of your career now, you're a fifth-year senior. You guys are playing, um, I think, and I know you're still injured, but you're playing Florida in the national championship game. That's when you guys were absolutely loaded. You know, you, you were number one in the nation. Uh, you just came off a huge win over Michigan, another exciting game. That's Anthony Gonzalez was on that team. You know, there's tons of talent. Did you have any idea what was going to happen in that national championship game with Florida? It was kind of like the imploding moment for Ohio State. I've never seen anything like that. I don't think anybody expected it to be like that. But did you know how talented Florida was? I just remember, and, and yeah, we had Troy Smith and Ted Ginn, and Ted got hurt, I think, in the first quarter. He did, uh, after they returned, I think, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, uh, and I think that was kind of a, a definite shift in the momentum right there. 
having one of our top guys go down so early, you know, and he was such a threat. You remember he was such a threat oh, on yeah. special teams. And um, I just remember watching and I was like, holy shit, like where did they get a defensive line like this? I mean, those guys, I mean, Troy had no time, no, you know, he didn't. in pocket. And uh, I mean, their, their ends, I mean, they were just their edge guys. I mean, they were just, they were studs. And I, I honestly don't even remember their names, but I just remember, you know, watching them and they were, they were just freaks. And I can't remember everybody in that defense, Mike, but there must have been, there had to be at least five or six NFL players. I know there was a, uh, oh, there yeah. a great safety. I can't remember who people are watching will remember, but they had a, a stud linebacker. I think Spikes, to, I think Brandon Spikes was on the yeah. team. And yeah, they yeah. were just absolutely loaded. And I, I didn't know a lot about those guys until that game. And I realized how great them. I, I knew they had a good team, but I thought it was going to be the opposite. I thought Ohio State was going to come in there and, and blow them out. It was, I mean, I've never seen a game quite like that. And I think that kind of put Florida on the map, Tim Tebow, you know, then you had that little run for a while. They won two out of three, and it put their program really back on the map. Um, you know, and it was uh, you know, so Ohio State's been a part of so many in just your career. The, you know, from freshman to the fifth year senior, you got to win one, and then you lost one. And you got to kind of have those experiences. So, what what did the difference between winning and losing, Mike? You know, the pain and the joy. What was that like for you? Um, obviously, you never want to lose, especially a game like that. You know. Um, you know, totally different. I mean, after we won the first game, I remember, you know, coaches were partying and everyone was having a good time. And, and the, the whole off season was just different. You know, I think immediately the mindset after that game against Florida was like, let's get in and get back to work. And, you know, I remember seeing coaches and, and, and players, you know, back in the, uh, you know, on the grind, literally a couple of days after we got back from that trip. And so, wow. and, and I think that's like that for any, any kind of institution like that, you know? Um, but yeah, anytime you put in, that amount of work and that amount of preparation and focus. And then you have that kind of result. It, it, uh, you know, it stings, no doubt. And looking back at your Ohio state days, Mike, what was the number, you know, what was the number one lesson you learned from your five years there? Oh man. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. Uh, you know, I, I would say when I look back on it, you know, I came from, um, you know, good, good neighborhood, great family. Um, you never really had much adversity growing up. And then, you know, when I, when I get into college, like I said, that second, you know, injury was, was, um, uh, you know, was the first time I really faced a, a lot of adversity. And, um, you know, I, I would, I would say um, learning to overcome that kind of stuff and, and working through really difficult periods, you know, um, after an injury like that. And, it's one of the reasons and I know, I know we're going to get into it, but um, you know, we have a mental performance coach on staff right now and she is just phenomenal at, you know, helping, helping our kids through, you know, periods of struggle or giving them the tools to that, you know, when they get into situations like that, you know, help kind of, you know, get out of it. Um, other than that, you know, I'd say, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of coach Tress and he'd have us read uh, like quotes every day. So we'd, we'd get into our meetings and we'd have, it was like five or 10 minutes of, of what he called quiet time where we read a passage or read a bunch of quotes and then like take down notes. And uh, the one that really stuck with me for whatever reason is the first hour is the rudder of the day. Um, you know, meaning like get your ass up and, you know, get moving and, yep. and get working because that's going to direct the rest of the day. So true. that was a good lesson I learned. That's very true. And yeah. let's get now into post-college and, you know, a, a young Mike, you're coming out of college and you're not, you don't have a business yet, but tell us how you came up with the idea and how did you get into eventually, you know, where you are now with owning T3 performance? Yeah. So I did not come up with the idea. Uh, so it's funny. I, I, I worked um, uh, at, at a company called first investors selling, you know, mutual funds and life insurance in Columbus. And I moved up to Cleveland uh, my buddy, you know, mutual friend, Jason Isley talked me into selling copiers for blue technologies, like the big copy machines. And, um, that was, that was actually a really good learning experience, you know, from a sales standpoint, uh, it wasn't the funnest going knocking on doors, but it was a great experience. Um, and, you know, while I was doing that, um, um, you know, another friend of a friend from a, a kid that I played with in college approached me and he's like, Hey, you know, my parents have this, you know, little gym in Westlake. Do you want to start training some athletes there? And, you know, of course I was always passionate about that. So I, I started doing that. And then within six months, um, you know, that opportunity turned into his parents want to kind of move on. So we partnered, kind of took the business over from his parents. And then uh, a couple years later, I ended up buying him out, but 
um, you know, yeah, that was 13 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And, and how did it, when it comes to T3 again, you know, like starting, starting the gym, did you under, you know, what, what year was that when it actually became T3? February of 09. Okay. So it's been 12 years now. That's, I mean, that's a long time. And I didn't realize it's even been that long. What was it like the beginning? Obviously starting any business and getting it going, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of, you know, hard work and, and constant struggle at being an entrepreneur because you're balancing five different things at one time. How did you mentally prepare for all that? And what did you, you know, what were the struggles like those first couple of years? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll be honest. I was, um, you know, in college, I was really focused on football and training and not so much on school and missed a couple classes in my day. And uh, so, you know, when I started, it's not like I had really much business experience at all. Um, but, but, and I always tell kids that I train this, um, you know, once I had something to put all my focus and energy into, you know, I, I'd quit the, the, the sales job or the copy machines. And so I was just all in on this, you know, gym and how to make it better. I mean, that's when I just started reading like crazy, you know, reading business books and talking to people and being curious and, and trying to seek out mentors and advisors and just learn as much as I could. And, at the time, to be honest, I was focused on two things and it was, you know, sell and do the best job I can training these kids to get better. And, and that's where I was, I was really lucky having the, the sales, it was really two sales jobs before this, because it, it taught me a lot about sales and, and, you know, gave me the discipline to be able to sit down and have a list of 50 names and, and hammer those calls out. And, um, you know, that, that's really what I would attribute a lot of our success to. And early on, it was just, it was really just me, you know, my partner, and then uh, Eric, our mutual buddy, Eric, who, who's still with us today, um, who was working with the kids. And so it was really cool. We got to know all the kids. We went to their games, you know, got invited to their graduation parties. And, um, you know, some of those kids I still talk to today. Um, so it was, it, was, it was fun. That's awesome. And yeah. you mentioned books that you, any good books that you've read as far as, you know, business books that, that come to mind that really helped you back in those days? Yeah. I mean, I, there's probably like 30, but uh, blue ocean strategy is, is great. Um, anything by Peter Drucker. Um, he was kind of like one of the first business management consultant guys back in the sixties and seventies and, uh, or maybe fifties and sixties. Um, uh, the hard thing about hard things, Ben Horowitz has a bunch of good books on business and culture. And I mean, there's just so many, um, you know, and now it's both books and podcasts. Um, or hopping on webinars, you know. Um, but I, I want to say it was, I think it was like Warren Buffett who who said the, the main reason he's successful is that he spends 80% of his time reading. And obviously with with his line of work, he needs to read about companies and know about all that kind of stuff. But I think that's true for most businesses. I mean, like, obviously you got to do the work, you got to train, you got to sell. Um, but any spare time you have, like, you just got to study and um so, you know, we, we try to teach our young coaches that now, and, and we have a great culture now of young coaches that are, you know, really becoming learners of, you know, the industry and of business. And take us through that culture. What, you know, the T3 culture, give us some, you know, what, what are the values and, and how did you, you know, your team come up with those values and what directs T3? Yeah. So, um, you know, amaze, take action and bring the juice are kind of our, our key, you know, core ideology. Uh, I'll, I'll, ideologies. Um, you know, it's like, you know, if something happens, if a parent has a complaint or something happens with a kid, like don't turn around and look at who can solve the problem. Like you solve it. So take action immediately. Um, you know, amaze kind of go above and beyond. So, you know, if someone calls up about a, a program, um, don't just say, Hey, the program's this time at this, you know, this date, like go above and beyond, ask about their kid and what their sports are. And if there's any other way you could help them. Um, and then bring the juice is like, you know, our core job is we are, at the end of the day, we're a company of coaches. And so we always talk about, um, you know, no matter how busy of a day or how tired you are, you know, once four o'clock hits, which is like our, our rush, when all the athletes come over from school, like you gotta be on, you know, you gotta bring the energy, you're there for the kids um, and, and, and they can tell, you know, they could tell if you're on or not. So um, I would say those are the things we try to have our coaches focus on the most. I love that. That's a great philosophy. And, and you, you know, me and you have talked, you know, of course, a lot about just the mental side of everything. And with you, Mike, how do you mentally prepare every day, you know, to go to work? And what is your philosophy as far as mental health and just, you know, the men, having the mentality of an athlete, like going into a game, um, you know, dealing with stress, anxiety, 
how, how do you deal with all that? And what is your philosophy on that? Just ignore it and hope it goes away. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think, you, you know, you, over time, I mean, we're what, 37. I mean, you learn kind of who you are personality wise and, and how, you know, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing um, to maximize your energy and, um, and attitude, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, getting to bed early, um, you know, reading at night. I mean, there's all the science behind like turning your lights off, wearing the blue blocking glasses. Um, we, we do, my wife makes fun of me. I have this whole like nighttime routine where I put on like mouth tape. So I just breathe through my nose at night. Really? There's a whole bunch of science coming out about how that, that helps you get into your deep sleep better and stay in deep sleep longer. And, and so that's going to improve my energy for the next day. And then when I get up, it's, um, you know, I try to get sunlight on my face, you know, first five minutes of the day, again, more science behind how that helps, you know, give you energy throughout the day and then just, you know, eat, work out, um, or just get right to it. Um, you know, some days I'll just sit down and, and get right into it. Um, and, and if I can do those things, you know, really like have a good nighttime routine, have a good morning routine, like in between is going to take care of itself. Um, you know, there's, there's periods where I'll work from home a lot and then I'll try to go in and, you know, communicate with my team, get a feel for what's going on and, and what they need help with. And, um, and I've been lucky. I mean, we have so many good people involved with our business. Um, you know, um, we're, and, and it's been, you know, trial and error over the years, getting the right people there. There's a great book. Um, I think it's called legacy and it was about the, uh, rugby team. Oh man, Australian or New Zealand rugby team. Uh, they were like the Patriots were here. I mean, they were just like winning every year and their big thing was, uh, no dickheads allowed. You know, and they, they taught their guys to be humble. If they went to a bar after a game, they'd clean up, you know, their own mess. They'd sweep the floor. Like that's kind of the, the mentality and culture we're trying to instill in our, in our coaches here. Um, and I feel like we, we don't have any dickheads on the team right now. So that's a good thing. Well, I mean, I've obviously been to your gym before and I've trained there and, you know, I, Joshua and I, you know, I've talked to Molly and Eric and a ton of people there and you guys have, you know, it's just so many great people you've had there throughout the years and still have now. And I, it's, it's a great facility. I mean, I've been there. I went there for about eight months and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved every yeah. second of it. I, you know, it transformed me really mentally more than even physically because physically, obviously it did a lot for me, but mentally, you know, I, I got to the point where I was more confident. Um, you know, mentally, I just had a better perspective and going in there, it was a positive atmosphere. And, and I, I never walked in there and had anybody look at me with a negative expression or down or everybody was positive and, and, and not fake positive, but like genuine, like, let's, let's get going yeah. here. Let's, let's do some stuff. So um, anybody that doesn't know about T3 performance and Avon, it's fantastic. And again, I've, I firsthand have experienced, you know, the coaching there and it was, it was awesome. So Mike, you know, as an entrepreneur so far to this point, what has been your biggest challenge? Um, you know, I, I'd say, you know, it always comes down to two, two things really. It's like early on, I had no clue how to, you know, develop systems and, and come up with systems and, you know, after the first couple of years, it's like, oh man, we're, we're seeing this mistake again. Let's fix it, you know, for good. Um, and so there's a lot of trial and error with how do we get the right systems in place to be as efficient and effective as possible. Um, my, my team knows, you know, the number one quote, I, I always, I probably say this several times a week, but um, it was by Peter Drucker and it's, there, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. Um, I love that. And so it's like, hey, look, you could be super active and look really busy, but are you actually doing stuff that moves the needle either for your clients or for the business? And if not, let's reevaluate and try to figure out, you know, the, how we can fix that system. So systems um, were probably the first thing. And then only uh, in, in the order of importance for how things evolved for us as a company. The second thing was, um, was people. And that really came about when we lost our first really good employee. And I mean, it's, it's great. She's back now with us and she's really helping the company and, and doing awesome for us. But, you know, we, that was, that was when I was like, man, we, we got to spend more time focusing in on our, on our people, not just worrying about, you know, how many athletes we're helping and, and training. Um, but you know, how are our coaches developing, you know, how are we, you know, helping them, um, create a true career out of this. And, you know, part of that it's, it's, it's a growing, growing experience. Um, but, um, but yeah, you got to figure those two, two things out earlier uh, than later. I know James Clear, author of Atomic Habits, always talks about, you know, 
the pro the systems and processes and, and obviously how, you know, don't look at your goals. Your goals aren't going to really solve your, I mean, yeah, you can get to a goal, but what, what are the systems behind that goal? You're not going to get to that goal unless you have healthy, you know, systems that are efficient and that make sense. Like you said, cutting out the waste, you know, cause I know for me, some of the things that I juggle, I can't, you know, there's no way that I can get everything done if I was doing either things inefficiently, number one, or number two, doing things that just waste time and don't really move the needle forward, like you were saying. And that's so crucial. And I think most people don't understand that, you know, who, who first start as an entrepreneur, it's hard to pick up on that until you really go through it. And you're like, okay, this is a complete waste of time. I'm not going to do this or that or whatever it might be. And once you get that down where you're very efficient and you're, what you're doing is really, you know, beneficial, it makes life a lot easier. And it really is. I mean, it's, it's a lot of trial and error. I mean, there's so many different ingredients that go into it. You know, the people you have, the personalities they have, like what kind of business you're in. Um, how do you get your clients? How do you keep your clients? And there's so many different things. So it's hard to just say, Hey, look, this system works for all businesses. Um, but, um, you know, I think just like anything, the longer you do at it, you know, the, the better you're going to get at it. Um, you know, and, and you're right. I mean, as far as goals, that's a great book, Atomic Habits. And, um, I forget where I read it, but something something like a couple of weeks ago where they were talking about how, you know, a goal and a plan to achieve that goal is nothing more than like a starting point, right? Like it, it's actually, it helps you be more adaptive along the way where it's like, okay, I know where I got to get to, um, you know, things are going to come up. I might have to adjust or course correct, but then I'm going to get right back on the path. And um, so, you know, goals are never straight line. No, that's for sure. Yeah. And, and Mike, when you look at T3 as a whole, we know what you've put into it and how you changed the culture there, but how, how has T3 changed you? Well, I, I, you know, in thinking of like looking back over the past 13 years, like, A, I'm just super lucky to be able to, you know, do my thing with, with this business that I love. And, you know, I'm not, I don't have to do something that I don't like. And, um, and I, I love, um, I guess being creative with the business and, and what direction we go and, and how we go and, and, and now helping the coaches kind of think like that. So, um, you know, last year over quarantine, um, we obviously couldn't train any athletes. And, and so we focus a lot more on the business side for the coaches and we, we try to help some of our coaches think more uh, like an entrepreneur. And so we, we have like several almost businesses within our business where, where, you know, we have someone that's, heading up our football stuff, but he, he really has a lot of say in how that's created. And, and so it's not like they just show up, clock in, coach, leave, like they get to actually create the programs and, you know, with, with the, the right framework around it that we help provide. Um, but that whole creative process, just like what you're doing, you know, with vintage, vintage ballers, I mean, it is, it is a shit ton of work, but it is so rewarding. Um, and, and it forces you and I know you're a big learner, but it forces you to get out of your comfort zone and teach yourself. Um, you know, if, if I were to just be a copy salesman, no offense, I know there's some guys that do a great job with that, but if I was to do that, um, I don't think I would have read nearly as much. You know, I, I um, maybe I would have, but I, I probably would have stopped a long time ago. Um, I don't think I would have reached out to as many advisors and mentors and learned as much as I did, you know, over the 13 years from people that I probably learned more in my first two years than I would four years at a business school, um, just from talking to people that had kind of been there and done that. And if I didn't have something to apply it to, I, I don't think I would have done that. You're so right about that. I mean, the first couple of years of being an entrepreneur for me, for, for sure, you learn more than you'll ever learn to me at, at, at business school or, or any other aspect of life, just because you're going through it. And yep. firsthand experience when, when you're owning a business and going through the trials and tribulations, and there's so much you face, and you have to juggle so much. You're not just thinking about one aspect. You're not thinking about just marketing or just sales. You're thinking about everything, payroll and, you know, and how, I mean, how website and design. And I mean, there's so much to look and, into. And, and it's just, it's so different. Like it could be the exact same content, whether you're in business, <laughs> business school or, um, sorry, my, my kids ding dong ditching me. <laughs> uh, whether you're in business school or whether you're in your first two years entrepreneurship in, in your own company, like it could be the exact same content, but the emotion tied to your own thing makes it just so much different, you know? Um, and I think that's what that's, you just can't get that in the school. No, I agree. And, and tell us about T3. What are some of the services, you know, that you, and programs that you guys provide? So our core, you know, of who we are and who we're always going to be is performance training. So no matter what 
you know, sport, um, you know, is your core sport or two or three, um, we're going to help you get faster, stronger, prevent injuries. Um, and, you know, we have, we have about 25 performance coaches that all have their, you know, exercise science degrees or kinesiology degrees. And um, so that's kind of our, our core focus, um, help athletes get better at their sport. And then from that, we, we also offer like sports skills lessons, um, you know, different camps and clinics and, um, you know, anything else that we can help move the needle on their performance. And where can people see, you know, what, what, what's your website, social media, where can people find all this? Yeah. So t3athlete.com is our website. Um, if you go to Instagram, it's T3 performance. Um, same with Twitter, same with LinkedIn. Um, yeah. If you want to sign up for our newsletter, you can do that on our website. So I'm actually, I do. So I sign up and your mental health part of it, you know, when you guys have the mental, I think it's every Thursday, I can't remember the date, but um, it's fantastic. I, I read okay. that all the time. There's a lot of great information in there, just the mental side of it alone. Yeah, that's something we, we over the past year, we've really tried to incorporate more, especially with the pandemic and kids not being able to play or whatever. I mean, it was, it was a shame. It was awful to see that with a lot of kids. But, um, um, you know, we, we try to help out with that where we could. So we'll do like, you know, either one on one work or like group sessions. And again, it's, it's more about we're not like having a kid lay down on a couch diagnosing all their problems, but we're, we're trying to give them tools to help them succeed when they face adversity or other things. And they are, they're very useful tools you can apply to everyday life. So it's not just for athletes to me, it, it, you can apply a lot of what you teach, you know, to just anything you're doing. So yeah. that's why it's so valuable beyond just sports, obviously. And then, you know, I, I've, like, I've been, me and you have talked about this a million times, you know, but just the, the mental side of anything in life is so critical, your perspective, how you deal, how you handle adversity. And, and, and I know for myself, I still struggle, Mike, I mean, with adversity, with things that happen. I have my days where I'm not in a good mood or I, I don't, I know I'm not, putting enough effort into certain things or whatever it might be. And it can be that to me, that is way more challenging than feeling sick. I mean, I got my second COVID vaccine shot a couple of days ago and I felt sick the next day, but I can still get through the day. But when I'm mentally not there, it's hard to get through a day when you're mentally just drained. Yeah. And, and I've had those days before too. And that's where like, it goes back to like, what are your, your habits? Um, you know, how well do you know yourself? And um, I, we, we've talked about this before, like, you know, tracking, like, what did you do the previous 24, 48 hours before you got into this bad state? Um, but, you know, Tony Robbins talks about that a lot. And I know uh, it's weird. I, I really like his stuff. I think it's helpful. Some people don't like it because it comes off as like salesy or woo woo. But, um, you know, his whole thing is like the psychology of the leader is what drives the business. And I mean, that is so true. I mean, how, how someone shows up, how they interact with their team, you know, the effort they put into their work. And, and so it's critical to take care of your, your mind first. It is. And it starts with you. I mean, it does start with the leader. It's, you know, just like any organization, I don't care if it's an owner in sports or a general manager, it starts with the philosophy and the culture, uh, you know, and on down. I mean, you look at the Browns now with Andrew Barry and Stefanski, everything changed in one year because the culture is different, you know, and they have a different philosophy. So, I mean, I'm, I don't I'm think a it's a huge Stefanski fan. That dude is awesome. Uh, he, they're fantastic. And I think with him and Barry together, both young, and they're both kind of, I mean, they're obviously intelligent, but they have a, they have a culture now that's, you know, they know how to handle certain things. They, they just handle adversity better. And I think they, you know, I mean, hopefully we're on the right track of finally getting to a Super Bowl at some point, but you can see what they've done in one year, you know, coming in and that, and just changing the entire philosophy of the Browns. Now we're known as a winning culture. Which, yeah. I mean, that would be laughable a couple of years ago, but you know, they, they have completely changed it. So I think having that, that side of it is so important to any business. It's not just about yeah. how famous you are, how, you know, people look at superficial things, but really it comes down to, like you said, culture, you know, bringing that energy, that psychology to the table every day. And what are you, how are you influencing the people underneath you? So. Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on with that. And I mean, the Browns is a great example. I mean, you know, just look, I mean, a couple of year, one to two year turnaround, a lot of the same pieces, but leadership's different. So that's where it starts. No doubt. Exactly. And yeah, I have a few more questions for you, Mike. And I want to I want to go back to Ohio State. A couple of guys that played for Ohio State with you, the late Will Smith. Obviously, he he was unfortunately uh, killed down I think in New Orleans. And you know, what were your interactions with him, and what was he like as a player? And he he was always super kind of warm hearted kind of guy. I mean, he was he was a dog on the field, obviously. But you know, outside of that, I remember being you know a freshman early on, and and you know, he kind of. I met with him a couple of times. He gave me some advice on, on things on defense. And, um, 
you know, just a cool guy to sit down and grab a meal with. Um, and, uh, you know, didn't, didn't hang out with them too much outside of the football, uh, you know, practices and training rooms and meetings, but, you know, we were both on defense. So we, we talked a lot and yeah, that was, that was a shame with how that all went down, down there. No, it really was. And I remember him, he was a great player. Obviously I never knew him personally, but I, I was very uh, stunned to see what happened down there. You know, I think it was four or five years back. Um, Maurice Claret. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, want to say hi. Got a little yeah. hi. stay out of the camera hey bud how you doing good you're on a podcast right now you don't even know what that means do you no, he doesn't i do oh, oh you yeah? do like a photo like a video Close. Like a, i'm a video like, yep it is you're right exactly what it is everybody <laughs> can i finish talking to my buddy i'll be out in a little bit yeah but one question it can be in your No, uh, not yet. In a little bit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, um, hey, dude, did I did I tell you Auburn's pregnant? Yeah, I saw I saw it on Facebook actually. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations on that. I was going to tell you that. Yep. Thanks, man. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah. How, how are the boys doing? Real quick, we'll go we'll go off topic real quick. Boys are great. They just had a little soccer game today. Um, so I, twin boys are six. Um, so they're awesome. They keep me busy. I was helping coach their football team for a little bit. Oh, really? They're getting yeah. so big now. I remember when they were tiny. Oh, it's crazy. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, they're reading, and it's just silly. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, actually, sidetrack on that real quick. You know, when you're juggling, like, personal life, family life with your business, how, how, do, you, how do you juggle that? Uh, I have an awesome wife who does a lot of the, the house stuff, even though she teaches herself, too. Um, and uh, it, it makes you um, – You can say hi to bud. Hi. Hey, buddy. How you doing? Good. <laughs> okay. Hey, guys. Be quiet, okay? Okay. Um, but uh, it makes you appreciate time a lot more, you know, because, I mean, from the second you get home, it's not like you can put your bags down and chill out for a little bit. Like, you, you got to, you know, be a parent and go out and play with them and, and do those kinds of things. And um, so it's fun. It's a good, good experience for sure. And, and Mike, and the last person I want to ask you about at Ohio State is a local guy, Matt Wilhelm, that you played with. Yep. What, was he, what was he like to play with, and what was he like on the field? It's funny you mentioned that. He just texted me a couple of days ago. So his kid, I think, is trained with us a little bit. Uh, he, he was a great guy. Um, we roomed together freshman year for camp. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he was always, even though, um, you know, we played the same position and stuff, he was always, um, you know, teaching different things, especially like in, in, in a film setting, very kind of cerebral guy out there. Um, and he was almost like a, a second coach out there at times and, um, you know, ended up having a great career in the NFL and, um, you know, he's been successful in business off, off the field. And um, so f phenomenal guy. And, and Mike, when you look back at your whole, so far, you're 37, obviously, and you have a successful business, you know, you play major college football, you're one of the most recruited high school players and, and, you know, in, history of, of this area so when you look back how do you see Mike DeAndre's legacy yeah uh, yeah I don't I don't really care I don't want to talk about that I mean I just you know I want to in, enjoy what I do with my business and and you know be a great dad for my kids and that's good enough for me I like it short a short and sweet I, it's funny because I get different answers for that all the time some people say the same thing like I don't really know how to answer that or you know other people have an elaborate answer but the short and sweet is interesting. I, I like that. It's just right to the point. And, you know, I, I think when you look back, like, I, I know when I look back at my legacy, I, I've never, it's funny because I've never even thought about that with myself, but I think it's just, you know, living the life I want to live and, and enjoying family, friends, that kind of thing, you know, more than mm -hmm. anything I do personally. So it's a, you know, similar answer. Yeah. It sounds way better than the answer I gave you. Maybe I should think about that a little more, but <laughs> it's still going to be in the, in that ballpark, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I want an honest answer. That's why I like that. Just right off the cuff, just what, you know, what do you think of? So I appreciate that. But yeah. Mike, again, man, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's been awesome. And me and you go way back and we could talk for five more hours about all types of stuff. But, um, oh, yeah. you know, appreciate you joining and kind of going over your career in T3 performance. And, you know, I look forward to more conversations like this in the future. Yeah, I no, appreciate you having me on, man. I love what you're doing. And uh, we'll have to catch up soon. Absolutely, man. We'll appreciate it, Mike. Yep. All right. Thanks. See you, Brett. Okay, see you.